before this week's episode, a behind the scenes quick update on Doug's run for U.S. Congress. Did you hear I'm running for Congress here in the U.S.? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, was, I wanted to ask you how that's going. Yeah. You had the primaries last week. Uh, yeah, we had the pri- we we kicked we kicked we kicked butt in the primary. We, we oh wow, nice! By, by over seventy percent, almost seventy five. Oh, wow. Um, so you know we're doing well. I mean, the general is going to be that's going to be a whole other animal. Uh, the district I'm running in is primarily a Democratic district, and I'm you know running as a Republican. But with everything that's going on in politics over yeah. here, yeah, you, you know there are yeah. people that are that are kind of. Oh you know, swinging a little bit to, to this end that want that safety and security. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, so that's the November, right? It's, it's that like- that's in November. Yeah. And so Monero, I always talk about crypto and Monero and that's, you know, a big, obviously what a big yeah. part of what I, what I believe in, uh, you know, free, free speech yeah. money. Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that can, uh, like that can be enough, like of a fresh wind to, <laughs> I guess there are lots of other issues as well, but yeah, yeah. now is the, it's the time for change right now. It's the time to, uh, yes. Propose new ideas. Yes, especially with everything that's going on in the world. You know, we're seeing we're seeing uh, you know a lot of people becoming cognizant of this you know uh, ability of of centralized technology to to, to censor and yeah. control when everybody you know people have been ignoring it. I think up until now, but we're really starting to uh, see its effects uh, even here in, you know in the United States. I mean, we even have you know Trump talking about you know, uh, whatever that he, you know, is not using Twitter anymore or, you know, like, yeah. Um, so, but I, I think that's bringing, it goes all the way up to the president. now. Yeah. Yeah. Which is amazing. And I think that that, that will inevitably bring attention to, uh, these technologies. This week on Monero talk is sponsored by cake wallet store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by Exmer.to, anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to Exmer.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and Exmer.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Leonard Weiss, president at the Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong. Douglas and Leo discuss the state of the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, the chilling effects of the national security law that was recently passed, the state of the pandemic, and the adoption of censorship-resistant technology in Hong Kong. Doug questions why Monero isn't being promoted more as a tool for private censorship-resistant money transfer at a time when the need is greater than ever. Monero Talk starts now. Leo, thanks for coming on. Good evening. So you're you're in Hong Kong, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Or things are maybe going not so okay. obvious to everybody that's watching, but obvious to me. <laughs> so yeah, uh, some people might recognize the landscape or the building how, style. How long have you been over there? Um, I moved to Hong Kong in 2011. Uh, to study statistics. It's been about nine years in Hong Kong, a turbulent and exciting time. And uh, right when Bitcoin was really starting to take off a little bit, 2011, is that when you discovered it? Yeah. yeah. I had heard of Bitcoin before I moved to Hong Kong, but I had not been able to find out how I can buy some, how I can use it, um, whether it's really going to work. I was quite skeptic. I also didn't understand technical concepts very well at that time. Um, so it's only in Hong Kong that I slowly found other people who had used it before, had figured out how to buy some. And it was just, yeah, it was a, a friend of mine who, and me who finally made that step of, of registering each other for Hong Kong and um, taking that leap of faith to make a transfer to Hong Kong. I have to say it already, it was 2012 and it already seemed like very sketchy. Um, they had a bank account in Poland uh, that I could wire money to. Um, and then I was quite impressed with their security. I, they sent me a little Yubi key um, that made me feel like, yeah, their accounts were unhackable. And I uh, put my coins into Mt. Gox. And quite luckily, over the course of 2013, 
when people were starting to complain on Reddit about uh, not being able to withdraw or um, outages or in, yeah, all these accusations of incompetency um, that I luckily got my coins out before. <laughs> oh, you did? Before okay. Yeah. Collapsed. Yes. That's good. Yeah, um, others were not as lucky. Yeah, yeah, I assume these proceedings are still going on. Uh, yeah, I haven't been following it too closely, but yeah, I'm, I'm assuming uh, it, it was never completely resolved. So when you got into Bitcoin, when, when did you actually truly start to understand Bitcoin uh, for, for, for what it is? is it, did you know going... That took a very long time. Um, we started the, hosting the meetups in Hong Kong in 2012. Um, so I think starting from then, I started to become more, um, yeah, more, more convinced that Bitcoin was really something like worth engaging with and worth uh, owning and worth using. And um, the goal of the meetup at the in 2012 was still very much to find others to talk to about Bitcoin. Um, there was very little resources. It's very ma many many questions that we had. Most of these events were beginning with the maybe four or five people asking each other questions and writing them down and then meeting after a month to compare notes and see what we found out. Um, some of us were trying to mine, some of us were simply trying to buy. And there were already some people who were um, figuring out whether they can trade Bitcoin as a, as a side hustle or even in replacement of the, of the main job that they um, they had lost or didn't want to continue. And and the Hong Kong Bitcoin meetup got quite famous, right? I mean, it's uh, one of the more, right? I, I think you. Um, I don't know if it's if it's very famous, but it's definitely one of the longer running uh, meetups, and it's still going on. Um, of course, keeping you've had the a schedule. Lot of big, as big names, I think, visit your meetups, right? <laughs> I mean, I think you've had a lot of big. Yeah, big we've definitely had quite a few people coming through over the years. Um, and we've also had some uh, very large, uh, large meetups. We've had hosted some conferences and some um, events that have attracted quite a few interesting people. Um, it's the community in general is still um, very much intact, and it's still very much um, one community. I think one thing that never happened in Hong Kong is a, is a community split. Um, it didn't happen over. Bitcoin Cash or the block size debate. It didn't happen over altcoins. Um, there's people like me who very much focus on Bitcoin. Um, there's other people who have been talking about nothing but Ethereum since 2014. Um, and yet it still, it still feels like one community and people are able to come together and mingle. I don't quite know um, why that is. I think especially online and social media there's been quite a few rifts um, but in hong kong maybe because the city is so small maybe because we run into each other all the time um, there's never been any like personal animosities hmm. that's interesting so so it's really not just a bitcoin meetup it's it's a crypto meetup or it sounds like right it's not is yeah, it, and of course there is. If there, of course, there have been many other meetups. Um, there have been many other groups that are um, hosting events or that are hosting talks. But uh, the community is very much one. And over the years, it's been mainly the Bitcoin meetup that sustained itself or that is still around right now. We are the only group that hosts meetups in Hong Kong. And I, I imagine it's a very international. It being Hong Kong. It's a very international crowd that, that attends the meetups. Yeah, and there's a lot of people traveling through Hong Kong, um, not in 2020, um, not as much in 2019. Um, but over the years, uh, what's made the Hong Kong Bitcoin meetup definitely also more interesting is that there's always been somebody who, who's traveling through or lives around the area or um, is able to share stories from, um, from how Bitcoin works in yeah, their respective region. And uh, I think many large cities have that, but in Hong Kong, really, the amount of people that travel through or even the amount of people that um, schedule their, their Hong Kong visits to the time when the Bitcoin meetup is on, um, it's been quite, uh, yeah, it's been quite a compliment. 
So obviously, yeah, it being, you know, with the, with the virus, I'm sure, you know, obviously the, the meetups are, if they're even existing at all right now, are obviously a lot, a lot smaller, I imagine. But before, before pre-corona, um, were you guys seeing a larger turnout due to the pro-democracy movement uh, before it kind of recently got, got crushed? I, 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 um, was there kind of a, was, this, was it peaking with that? Were more people coming out to... To learn about Bitcoin mm -hmm. as the pro-democracy movement gained attention? Um, no, not at the meetups. Um, we've seen some spikes on the website uh, in terms of traffic. Um, we've definitely seen a lot of organizations reach out um, with uh, questions or with uh, even um, yeah, advice on how to accept it as payments. Or um, some individuals have been asking how they can use Bitcoin to more privately buy things online, um, especially, yeah, ma uh, dust masks um, or um, goggles or medical equipment, um, because people have been arrested simply for possession of these things. Um, and people have been arrested for, um, yeah, simply making group purchases or simply um, shipping these things into Hong Kong. And to some degree, cryptocurrencies uh, do help, um, but they do not, uh, they're not a, a, they're not a magical bullet um, for privacy in this case, um, because a much more difficult, um, much more difficult thing to do is to have it shipped into Hong Kong and not have it intercepted by customs. Customs was, uh, trying to find shipments with masks or shipments with black t-shirts um, and then having a kind of uh, accepting that securely and distributing that at a protest or reselling it to to friends um, that's far far more difficult and so far we have seen the Hong Kong police go after um, payment details of, of seizing information of requesting information re related to especially the octopus card that's very popular in Hong Kong, which is a little like a transit card, um, NFC transit card. It's very convenient and that can be attached to your name, can also be bought um, anonymously. Um, but we haven't seen really large scale um, investigations based purely on, on, on payment methods. Um, I do think this will all eventually come. We are, we're already seeing pretty much a, pretty much all of it, a daily um, a daily flood of news of uh, pro-democracy shops or restaurants or NGOs having their bank accounts seized, um, also having their shops broken into. I think just yesterday um, was one of these shops that, yeah, is already quite wary of putting their money into a bank account, um, had their um, had their yeah stash of cash um, stolen from their shop. Um, so then. Between those two options, um, despite their volatility, cryptocurrencies do suddenly stick out. Hmm. So I guess I should have asked this uh, in the, at the start of the interview. You want to give us a little bit of kind of a, a feel for what's going on in Hong Kong in terms of the state of the pro-democracy movement? I know the national security law was recently uh, passed and kind of the state of, you know, the pandemic in Hong Kong. Like, what, what is it like on the ground in Hong Kong right now with the yeah. pandemic and the national security law that's in place and the pro-democracy movement. What, what are things actually like over there? So the main protests, uh, clashes with police that you may have seen on TV, um, that's been all over the news in 2019, um, that mainly ended in late November um, with like a very, um, with a very landslide-like victory for the pro-democracy camp in the district council elections. District Council is more than an advisory body. It doesn't hold any real power, um, but it is pretty much the, the, the only one person, one vote um, that people have in Hong Kong. Um, it's really a very small municipal body that is supposed to facilitate kind of neighbor relations between residents and police, or between residents and government. Um, and they won about 80% of the seats. Um, for the democratic camp, uh, far, far more than expected. 
Um, since then, there haven't been any large scale clashes. There have been a few protests around um, the holidays, especially January 1st um, was a bigger one. Um, starting with the epidemic in mid January, that's when Hong Kong people started to get very, very um, alert about um, a unknown pneumonia um, occurring in Wuhan. Um, Hong Kongers are still, like, the, the memories of SARS 2003 are still very much in their memory. Um, they're still very much alive. Uh, people took very early on quite strict measures. People stayed at home, people wore masks, people were obsessively washing their hands. Um, they, the medical teams, the, the doctors went on strike in January to pressure the government into closing the border with China. Um, I think these strikes, that's the one point where the pro-democracy movement and the um, fear of the virus or the epidemic do overlap because these unions that were organizing the strikes were mainly pro-democracy unions, were mainly newly formed organizations that um, were just meant to carry on that, that fight for democracy. And now we're seeing themselves uh, convincing the government to shut down the border, close the border, implement quarantine measures. Um, that was done in early February. Um, there have been relatively few cases in that first wave. I think that's also a testament to how, um, lo how loosely Hong Kong is still integrated with the mainland Chinese economy. There aren't that many flights between here and Wuhan. Um, there might be trains going from here, but there aren't that many people taking them. Um, so we didn't, in, the, in that first wave, when people were probably most concerned, when people were really convinced this virus is already everywhere and I might already have it, and uh, people were, yeah, streets were empty, shops were empty, um, the supermarkets were empty as people were trying to um, like stock up with supplies. Um, it, or, that's also when uh, so the government was relatively slow in implementing the measures that people were asking for, um, such as border closures or mandatory quarantine um, or large scale testing. Um, but the government was, of course, also already early on using it to limit protests. Um, it was a, um, a gathering ban, like social distancing rules. Um, they were primarily enforced against people who were protesting. Um, and these rules have been then used to deny um, ac applications for protests um, pretty much throughout the entire year. Um, in March, there was a large influx of, as, as the virus is spreading in Europe, there was a large influx of uh, Hong Kongers living in Europe coming back. Um, until it took quite a long time until quarantine had been extended to arrivals from anywhere, arrivals from Europe. Um, starting from late March, pretty much everybody arriving in Hong Kong has to be quarantined for two weeks, regardless of where they come from. Um, if they come from a very high risk area, um, they even have to quarantine in a government facility, uh, which is like a, a public housing estate, um, specifically in use for, um, for quarantine. Um, the marches um, were never able to pick up again ever since this uh, considered a truce in, mid, in late November um, when yeah this landslide election kind of gave the democracy movement really like a um, like a lot of justification like a lot of uh, um, yeah, really more justification of, of, of kind of ending the argument that this is just a small minority of people that support this. It's just nobody supporting the riots. That's what the government is claiming. Um, and suddenly people who were dressing up in, in full full uh, protest gear, um, were 18 year olds dressing up in full protest gear, not having any political, um, um, not having any political arguments other than we fight for democracy were winning elections against so-called heavyweights that have been holding their seats for 20 years plus um, that was quite uh, quite a shock i think to many especially in the in the government camp um, because this isn't this was an, a result that the government was unable to ignore um, this is really the, the people having spoken so no 
um, uh, there were no allegations of uh, of these votes having been rigged. Hmm. Um, there is another election coming up in um, in September, and of course now with the enactment of the national security law, everything has changed. Um, suddenly speech has been criminalized, um, protests have been criminalized, um, a lot of the protest slogans um, and protest imagery has been criminalized. And the movement is still like struggling to figure out what this next stage is. I think it's, uh, it's far exaggerated to say that the protest movement is dead or that the protest movement of the entire like uh, this entire struggle is over um so far people have been mainly signaling to each other that they're going underground um people have been removing their social media profile people have been um leaving their um their parties or disbanding their parties or disbanding their ngos um but uh these people are quite determined and they don't really see another option than to, um, yeah, than to stand up for themselves. Um, so we don't really observe like a large outflow of, of residents. We don't really see um, people fleeing so far, even with the promises that have been made by, um, especially the UK uh, in terms of um, giving Hong Kongers like a path to UK citizenship. Um, so far we don't really see um, people leaving. We don't really see the sentiment being that uh, we give up and, and people are moving overseas. Um, but rather, the sentiment is that there's uh, a new phase, um, that people are changing their tactics in the same way that um, this national security law kind of represents a change in tactics. Um, people are also going to, um, yeah, going to do things differently in the future. Um, we see a Telegram groups being closed, Telegram channels being closed, um, away from from single actors having a large audience, more towards people discussing in their own personal groups. Um, people have been switching to Signal in the masses, you kind of like Signal modifications getting nowadays, new people signing up, um, and then people are creating smaller groups that might only have like three or five people in them. Um, but these are all then individuals that they personally trust a lot more and through which um, I don't exactly know what to expect, but are organizing a different kind of uh, tactics of um, what they call resistance. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's just so much to ask. So, but how about like Nathan Law, he, he left. So did he that, left. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, did yeah. that have- He was one a, of the high profile people to leave. Yeah, did that have a high, of, like any effect on the movement? What was the reaction to that? What, what were people, kind of other insiders or big people in the movement, like how were they reacting to that? Um, I know? think people are a bit split on how how to receive this because on one hand, there's also a few, especially some of the more radical um, activists or some of the more, um, yeah, people outspoken on like these taboo issues of, of secession. Um, they also left. Um, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a difficult debate for many of like, should we leave? Should we stay? Um, who should leave? Um, there is a, this question came up already and was quite uh, well covered in um, 2019 when, or 2018 when one of these, they call themselves Hong Kong indigenous. They were a, called a localist group um, of people who were, yeah, Already at a time when, already at a time when the confrontation between, like China and Hong Kong, um, rather than the Hong Kong government and Hong, and the Hong Kong people, um, was at a time when these confrontations were not as visible, they were already trying to um, put them first, um, meaning they were already in 2016 trying to frame this as a conflict between. Communist Party and the Hong Kong people, rather than what it was framed back then, it's just like a governance issue um, in the, affecting the Hong Kong government. Um, they, this group, also came up with the um, infamous pro protest slogan of "Reclaiming Hong Kong," um, and their leader was jailed um, for participating in a in a riot in 2016, which, compared to what happened in 2019, was really 
um, barely barely a protest. Um, and they also had this discussion of like who should who should flee and who should stay. And um, they decided to kind of split them up. And I don't know if they flipped a coin or how they decided that internally. But they said that some of us have to have to leave um, simply because if the worst happens, then some of us will keep keep having to. Um, like speak out for for Hong Kong and speak out for those in jail um, from abroad, um, and uh, yeah, one of these people was able to um, get an asylum claim in Germany, which was also very big news um, then um, because that was the first Hong Kong asylum seeker who had been accepted by a democratic Western state um, as a legitimate um, political refugee, um, and I think. With the enactment of that national security law, um, that becomes a lot more common. It becomes a lot more likely. The way the national security law is written makes it relatively easy to make an asylum claim. Um, because it's relatively easy to say, "Here's this law. This uh, this outlaws my political opinions." And the kind of legal mechanisms it has to protect uh, me or to protect innocent um, uh, th those innocently accused. Um, aren't exactly there. And at the same time, these um, um, the sentences are very draconian of up to 10 years for speech or even possible extradition to the mainland. And who knows if, uh, if that could include death sentence. Um, so it's become relatively easy for Hong Kong is to be able to go abroad and say, it's not, many, it's not def it's definitely not easy in the epidemic for them to go abroad, but it's easier for them to once abroad, say, I have a legitimate asylum claim and I would like to um, apply for that status. Hmm. Uh, but that, of course, that also means that these people cannot come back, right? That means that, these, um, that whoever is uh, who's a refugee is unable to come back to Hong Kong. That's a very difficult decision to make, not being able to see your family, you know. Um, and yeah, not being able to even have a regular travel document anymore. Yeah, no, no. It's uh, it's, it's crazy. So, I mean, so is this causing um, more interest in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? So, like we said, like, you know, when the when the movement what, what was at its height, uh, I, I would think people were getting. But now that the national security law was passed, I would think that would even kind of push more people to now look at censorship resistant technologies yeah. like, like yeah. you know, Bitcoin and Monero. Is, are you seeing that effect? Yeah. Is that palpable? Um, I am not directly seeing that effect right now, um, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. And it just means that we need to like more closely look out for some of the metrics that we use to determine whether there is like an uptick in interest, um, so especially from, from activists. Um, they're not exactly like contacting me this week and asking me how to set up a Bitcoin wallet. Um, the, uh, the kind of interest we do get is from international NGOs. Um, that have been um, that are now more worried about having their bank accounts seized as well, um, and having their um, yeah simply having to more covertly um, operate, um, same, similar to how it used to be in mainland China before NGOs were completely kicked out. There was a phase in, in China when NGOs were still somewhat able to operate, but um, yeah, just couldn't properly get funding or couldn't properly pay people, and there was all these barriers put in place, even though. Um, even though they, these NGOs still existed. Um, today, NGOs um, don't exist in China anymore. There's no, um, there's no functional civil society at all, especially not one that um, has any kind of ties to foreign entities or has any kind of ties to foreign donors. Um, and in Hong Kong, I think um, that's also the direction of where we're heading, um, of organizations like Amnesty or um, yeah, legal legal help or um, reporter organizations being um, yeah silenced, and uh, first the government is going to make life very difficult for them, and eventually they might uh, they might disappear. They might have to uh, shut down. So when you talk to your average pro democracy uh, advocate in Hong Kong. Do they get excited when you when you talk about crypto? Do they are they like, oh yes, it's censorship resistant. This is an amazing uh, feature that it has. Are they like, like I'm excited about it? Obviously, you know, and you know, I'm an American. You know, I'd give you so many reasons of why why we need to hear. 
over there under the circumstances that they're under right now. I would think they would be, you know, uh, you know, embracing this fully. So, I mean, do they at least talk about it in a way where they fully grasp the, the capability and potential of the, the technology? Um, so we do have a have a large community of people who are very excited about it, right? The people, the Hong Kongers that come to our events, the, um, the, the ones that take part in online discussions. I mean, they're very excited about it. Some of them have been excited about it for years. Some of them have been only gotten into it recently. I would say as a mass phenomenon, people are more overwhelmed with that feeling of loss, of that feeling of, uh, of, of losing the other tools that they have and that they may have a, got accustomed to. Um, so for them, the idea that they um, might have their credit card application denied or might have their, their payment processor taken away from them and they now have to figure out how to make all that work for Bitcoin is not like a super exciting, um, mm. not a super exciting uh, prospect. Uh, the fact that there is something uh, that uh, is going to remain um, gives people hope. Um, being able to uh, make payments even when everything else is shut down is, of course, uh, like a, like a bit of a hopeful uh, prospect in the same way as that there there is always going to be a way to communicate with others as long as the internet exists. Um, that the way the Tiananmen um, movement in 1989 was crushed was very much by just taking that sense of community from everybody and making it impossible for people to talk to each other. And in 1989, that was uh, in, in 1989 in, in, in an authoritarian mainland China, that was very easy. And in 2020 in, in Hong Kong, that's going to be very difficult. Eventually, eventually, the the economy here um, does rely on the open internet, and it does rely on its ability to, yeah, contact servers and individuals all around the world on a on a gigabit per second basis. And taking you cannot take one away without uh, destroying the other as well. You cannot take people's ability to communicate away um, without also destroying the ability for international businesses to function here. So all these um, repressions are going to come at quite a significant economic cost. And um, we do tend to think that nowadays uh, the Communist Party does not put economic uh, welfare first. They've removed the GDP goals, for example, for, um, for their annual, um, the annual goals this year. But they still very much need to serve their own constituency as well. And their own constituency is highly invested in uh, Hong Kong as a financial system, as a financial um, uh, city. And um, threats from um, the United States to cut off Hong Kong from the, from the SWIFT system are, of course, uh, seen as a bit of a nuclear option. But they're taken very much seriously here by the, by the ruling elites. Uh, so there is a chance they will be uh, willing and able to negotiate about Hong Kong's, uh, Hong Kong's civil liberties. Um, while at the same time, um, yeah, kind of having that, um, that very real possibility that all of the wealth that's been created over the years is going to evaporate from, uh, from one year to another. Hmm. So the national security law, I mean, it's, you know, the, the things that they, the powers that it gives them, it's, you know, very scary stuff here. I mean, has the, have they talked about cryptocurrency or Bitcoin at all? And that there is there any hint that you know they may make that illegal in, in Hong Kong? Use use of cryptocurrency. So the national security law itself is very very broad. Um, it can be interpreted in many different ways. And what we're waiting for is these specific implementations of these separate articles. Um, so we've had one last week, um, which was mainly targeted at. Um, at partly communications, partly seizures, like uh, warrantless searches. And each of these implementations are expected to take even to take even more civil liberties away from people. Um, theoretically, the ability to exchange currency into each other, the, theoretically, the ability to have an open um, financial market or currency markets is actually enshrined in the Hong Kong Constitution and the Hong Kong Basic Law. Uh, which is a very peculiar detail. Uh, I don't think uh, too many places have that. Um, but so that has a very high standard of, of protection. 
But in, of course, when it comes to national security cases, um, all these uh, protections in the basic law are worthless. Right. And um, what we're waiting for is specific implementations of the national security law that are going to target specific groups. Um, so the first one came more about um, warrantless uh, phone searches and, uh, and, and, and seizures. It does allow for uh, asset forfeiture. It does allow for um, for blocking platforms and, and, and censoring content. Um, if there's something that already could be enough to go against Bitcoin providers that to take down ATMs or to shut down exchanges, um, very likely before that happens, there's going to be another law that specifically like outlines this intent. Um, the way the way the government wants to exercise its power over, over Hong Kong is not so much by having to knock on everybody's door and explain to them what uh, it is that they want them to do, uh, but rather they want to signal first here, this is uh, going to be the new accepted, um, accepted policy. This is going to be the new red line. And then they want them to stop uh, voluntarily. Um, the government wants us all to comply um, without making a big fuss and without them having to and individually ask us uh, what to do. So I do expect more specific rhetoric um, in that regard before it happens, um, meaning we only have like a week notice. Um, and then it is definitely possible that trading Bitcoin in Hong Kong or um, buying Monero is going to become a lot more difficult um, right now. There's a very large network, so a network of ATMs. They don't ask for personal information. You can just put in cash and get cryptocurrency out. Um, you can do so while while being masked. Um, very very socially accepted nowadays. Um, it's entirely possible that these machines will be taken down upon the request of the government in a few weeks or months. Um, that will leave these online peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Um, exactly how how people will continue operating there um, is also um, a, big, a bit of a question. Um, I'm convinced it will always exist. Um, people will always figure out ways to even just operate bank accounts from overseas and continue trading Bitcoin from there. But then the, the spreads might have to be large enough to compensate for eventual like seizures or eventual account closures. Hmm. I'm just uh, so are are you uh, are you a Monero guy as well, or are you more are you just purely Bitcoin? Um, mainly using Bitcoin. Uh, the Monero community in Hong Kong is uh, is definitely there, and it's uh, very closely intermingled. Um, some of our members are uh, much more into Monero than they are into Bitcoin. Um, for me, it's been something that I've been like uh, that I've been using that I have a bit of exposure to, um, but not something that I had a lot of chance of, of using on a day to day basis. Like I have with Bitcoin. Now, your fundamental—I mean, everything we talked about today has to do with you know, uh, you know what's happening in Hong Kong and, and, and you know the national security law and is the censorship-resistant properties of Bitcoin. Is that what excites you most about Bitcoin, or is it—is it just are we only talking about that because that's what's going on in Hong Kong, or is that what you see as being the value proposition of this technology itself? I have to admit that when I got into Bitcoin, I didn't really expect the price to go up um, the way it has. I mainly expected my Bitcoin stash to be, uh, to be, yeah, you know, like a bug out bag, uh, a content in a bug out bag. And so I got into Bitcoin with the expectation that Bitcoin is going to be eventually illegal um, and that uh, and the excitement that Bitcoin is going to continue to function in such an environment. Um, and I think that, uh, is very much what makes Bitcoin unique, and that's where it very much what makes Bitcoin interesting from a political perspective. Uh, we don't really know how to shut off, sh shut it off. We don't really know how to uh, turn off Bitcoin wallets or, or turn off the network. Um, and this is the one thing that, uh, yeah, whether this succeeds or not, it's not up to regulators or not up to governments at all. It's just up to um, the users and how they find it useful and valuable. Um, I've also not been much of a person who's interested in investing. Um, I do buy Bitcoin not because I consider an investment. I consider it some, something between speculation and savings. Um, but 
it needs to be successful as a, as a means of payment, needs to be successful as, as currency. Um, because if we don't use it as that, then it's just, it's just any kind of asset and anything can be an asset, right? So like you think that, um, and anything is an investment, anything, there is no, there are no network effects in, in investment assets. And, the, and that very much limits its, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's future potential. I think we see that a little bit with the kind of uh, tokens that are coming to the market um, that are mainly advertised as a, as a means of investment. And um, there's just more and more and more of them, right? There's no... Yeah, the, tr the true value no networks the effects to it, is right? the network yeah. effect. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I got to tell you, you know, I talked, I talked to you and, you know, this, this, this show, I don't know if you ever watch this show, but it kind of always leads back to the, the same debate. So I talked to somebody like you, especially you being in Hong Kong, truly understanding the value proposition, understanding that, that the censorship properties, censorship resistant properties, and the unconfiscatable properties are, are really the most important thing. And then obviously with the network effect, right? Because you need people to actually use it. How are you not more of a Monero person? Is, you know, like how are you uh, not more inclined to be pro Monero as you witness what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, knowing that you know China controls you know over two thirds of all the mi all the Bitcoin mining? I have to imagine that would concern you a little bit. I mean, we we know that China clearly. Uh, what they believe in goes go, is completely opposed to the ideals of what Bit, the purposes Bitcoin is supposed to serve. Yet two thirds of the mining is happening in in this country. How do you not get more excited? Or uh, why aren't you a bigger Monero guy? I, mean, I, I just what just help me understand that. What what is your thinking there? Um. So I think Bitcoin has not just been a, a gateway drug for me, but I think it's also a gateway drug for others. And I think, um, especially for us here in Hong Kong, it does make more sense for us to promote this gateway drug um, and see how people then like trickle into the into the ecosystem themselves. Bitcoin is still the first thing that people have uh, have contact with. It's still the first thing that people hear about. Um, it's definitely the first thing that people have like some kind of financial exposure to that's the only it's one of the few things you can really buy at an atm or one of the few things that has sufficient liquidity on, on the hong kong exchanges um and then um things like monero um or uh, another topic that is often asked about is ethereum and it does quickly come up um and we do like to uh, debate its merits and debate uh, its uh, disadvantages um the big issue that we talk about all the time is like scaling. How can we really bring a cryptocurrency to um, to not just the million people using it now, but a hundred million or a billion people uh, within yeah within this decade? Um, and so for me, as a as a Monero user, um, I've always had it a bit more difficult to use Monero. I've had it a bit more difficult to acquire Monero compared to Bitcoin, um, and that's also made me then. Um, a little bit less inclined to like openly promote it. Um, so when we do have um, people interested in Monero, um, then that's that's all we talk about. Um, but it's not something that um, that I tend to bring up in a conversation. That's hmm. for me. So that's a, yeah, that's my honest response. But but I mean, you you experienced Bitcoin when it was like Monero. Now I mean, right? Like I mean, you were there in two thousand yeah, eleven. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, and it was difficult to use back then, for sure. Right, um, right. It's hard for me to set up a, a wallet in 2012. Actually, in 2011, I completely failed. That's part of why. That's probably why it took me until 2012 to buy my first Bitcoin. Uh, I was actually really unable to run a to run Bitcoin QT on uh, on my laptop in 2011. It's just I don't know what, what where where I where I failed. Um, and even 2012 was still relatively difficult. Um, yeah. I, progress is uh, the progress is being made um the pointing people at a good bitcoin wallet is still very difficult um but it is a bit more easy at pointing people to a good for example mobile um, monero wallet um, and instructing people on how to set up their own bitcoin node and um, then also yeah really using it um is still I think for for us in our events and, and 
given our uh, given our audience a bit more easy to do. Um, the conversation around um, cryptocurrencies that are not Bitcoin is a very difficult one to have, um, especially when talking to an audience that is um, yeah that has only recently gotten into it. Um, there are thousands of, of assets that are to the to the user at first are completely indistinguishable, and we probably both agree that probably almost all of them are um, are trash. Um, but then it takes me a while to even get the confidence of um, and and the, the level of uh, and have that expectation and that level of understanding on the other side to be able to talk about why are they trash and why can something specific not be trash? Um, because this this phrase that 99% of all tokens are um, a fraud. Um, this is something very much being adopted by fraudsters. Um, fraudsters will, will also start that conversation saying that, yeah, I'm talking about Bitcoin now for the first 30 minutes because that's the first thing that's, uh, that's going around. And that's the one thing that's, um, uh, that has like, uh, gotten by far the most um, traction. And now we, we know that 99% of tokens are a fraud. And now I will tell you about that one thing that isn't. Um, and it's very hard for us to, to differentiate in that. Of really, f finding the people who who are able to follow us, right? We're able to really understand what it is we're trying to convey. And um, I fear that by far the majority of people that we do talk to, we then seem to be indistinguishable from the people who have the same thirty-minute talk and then mention, yeah, some unheard blockchain, um, and that's. I think that continues to be like a massive concern. And that's why I'm saying when somebody comes up uh, to us and, and mentions Monero, then that's that's what we talk about. And that's what we that's what I like to spend like uh, some brain power into. Um, but it needs that like that first step first, you know, it's, it needs it. that revelation of like, hey, this is this is I, I understand this like I I have myself reached the conclusion that like Monero sticks out and what do you guys think, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. While it's difficult for me to go the other way and say, oh, by the way, there's, there's one thing that sticks out. Mm. Yeah, I hopefully that will start to change a little bit because I, I do find it, you know, I mean, are, are you even like concerned when you talk to people and, you know, people may be, you know, coming to these meetups or talking to you online uh, with the intention of, you know, in America, using Bitcoin is one thing, but there might be people approaching you that really need it for those censorship resistant qualities. Are you ever concerned that, uh, you know, by if, by using Bitcoin and if they're not capable of using it in such a way that it, it may lead to, to problems for them, that they, you know, the, the Chinese government may, may see that they sent $100,000 of, of Bitcoin, you know, from Hong Kong to the United yeah. States or whatever it may be, or out of China. Um, are you concerned about that when you, when you talk to people? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, we do talk about Bitcoin and, and its qualities and, and not just censorship resistance, but really like the privacy aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, in Bitcoin, that's a much more difficult conversation to have than in Monero. Um, because in Monero, the privacy protections are much more built in and you can much more fearlessly use it for whatever you want to use it for. While in Bitcoin, we first need to have that discussion of like, hey, be careful, like what wallet are you using and like where are these funds coming from and where are they going to? Because there is quite a few things that, um, that yeah, blockchain analysis firms are able to find out simply by, um, simply by having like being told by the exchange what your name is and what the addresses that you paid out to and then seeing that funds flow directly from there to like a dark net market or things like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how about the mining? So we, we know that there's a ton of mining going on in, in China, almost I think over two thirds of the, of, of the mining uh, power is coming out of, out of China. What, what's your reaction there? Is that is that a concern of yours? Um, not as much because i think mainly this kind of uh mining power is much more difficult to to politically co-opt um like i don't think that 
it's very easy to like in one one step like seize all these servers and use them to to double spend Bitcoin. Um, I think the because the the environment is changing like very very rapidly with the development of constantly new uh, new ASIC chips and the deployment of, of more and more hardware. Um, if you have 10% of the hash power today, then you might really only have 2% at the end of the year. Um, so there's a, a constant shakeup and, and the kind of people who own a Bitcoin today, you know, they still own one of 21 billion, 21 million Bitcoins next year. Um, people who mine Bitcoin today might be completely different to the ones um, that are mining Bitcoin next year. And we've, we have, um, it's not, not as easy as closely observe that as other things, um, but there does seem to be a move away from mining in China, um, even including by Chinese miners. Uh, and partly that's because all the cheap electricity has been has been used up um, in China, uh, but also because the um, yeah the, the political climate is no longer as uh, as acceptable um, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, that was especially true in 2017. Um, when the government outright banned ICOs and closed all the exchanges. And that was a strong signal for the miners to, to diversify. So they diversified a lot into um, uh, Central Asia, into North America, and yeah, a little bit into South America too. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of speculation going on about how much Bitcoin mining nowadays is going on in Africa, which uh, I'd love to get some uh, hints at. Um, because there are there are parts of Africa that have massive amount of um, electricity in the form of uh, in the form of water, for example, and Bitcoin has reached the point where some miners that pool together are able to to finance uh, building a, a dam in a in a relatively remote location, um, which yeah, if they can keep it secret, provides them a very high degree of uh, yeah accessible free electricity. Why do you why do you think the Chinese government has been um, why, why have they allowed Bitcoin mining as much as they have up until this you know given what they um, what they stand for and what they what they actually I think buy? that has to I think that has to do mainly with the dynamics of uh, of the bureaucracy on the ground um, the power companies are usually private uh, public partnerships um, so there's a bit of private investment but they're ultimately um, regulated and run and administered by local governments and um, they, they can be subsidized by the central government um, in the form of, uh, of, of cash subsidies where exactly especially counties in the periphery are being given cash to build a dam um, that they then control themselves to attract investment to be able to say we can um, we can offer you almost free electricity if you build your factory here. And in a lot of these places, as you can imagine with the misallocation of, of capital going on in a, in a quasi-communist regime, the cap, the, these dams are built in areas where the factories are still not going to want to go to. Even if there's a dam and free electricity, there might still be no, uh, no, no road that can, uh, that can facilitate like heavy trucks to go up into the mountains. And for the local government to then have an offer from a cryptocurrency miner is very difficult to turn down. And then for the central government to then go and say, you cannot make this exchange um, is even more difficult because the, the local government will need that extra cash. Um, that dam that they put so much hope in is, uh, is uh, it's lying around useless. And eventually the central government then faces the accusation of, hey, you've been giving us these, these handouts to build a dam and to revive our economy. And now we're unable to attract investment because you tell us this investment is not acceptable. Um, so I think it, it's not so much that the central government like really wants all of this to happen, but that they face their own, they face their own difficulties. And, and yeah, and simply these are very far away counties. This is really the, the far away periphery and these people also have to be um, kept somewhat happy. Um, I think another reason um, that is also related to why Bitcoin is still not illegal in China is that the government doesn't really want to ban something that they're unable to enforce, um, like uh, having any kind of laws on the table that um, that are just openly openly broken is uh, very embarrassing. And so um, Bitcoin, which is very difficult to suppress, it's impossible to ban somebody from making a Monero transaction. And so then why um, why make that explicitly illegal? 
do you think there there might be some strategy with with wanting to have control, some type of, of control over Bitcoin? Um, I personally don't expect that, mainly because the conversations that we've that we followed or the statements that we've heard, they all point to the Chinese bureaucracy being convinced that Bitcoin is just not here to stay and it's just going to go away anytime soon. And if they can only suppress it long enough, then uh, that's something that's not going to be relevant in the long run. Um, but you really think that's that's generally that's generally how I believe they think. Really, that the, the 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 people in control don't don't realize they don't take it seriously. And by the time it will, they will take it seriously. There will be much less they can do about it. Hmm. I find that hard to believe. I mean, I, I you know these are very intelligent people that are controlling a yeah. very powerful country. Um, yeah. How would they not grasp this technology at this point? Given that they that that what they really believe in is the opposite of what this technology is pursuing um, to do. You have to consider that they're also very much convinced of themselves and their ability to um, to really guide the country. Um, the, everything in, in China, everything online, there is really at the, the whim of the officials. Um, just yeah, nowadays you cannot even share um, URLs anymore in in WeChat or in um, Weibo unless they are deemed acceptable. Right, there's a list of right. So isn't isn't that sites. all evidence of the fact of how sensitive they are to technologies and the fact that some new technologies may may erode their their power and ability? Oh yeah, yeah. To censor and yeah. surveil. Also, I think they'd be one hundred percent aware of, of Bitcoin's uh, abilities to potentially thwart that and would be, uh, you know, on on the ready to to, to eliminate it or try yeah. So. Control. They definitely, they definitely still allow some kind of Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer trading. They definitely still allow some kind of Bitcoin mining. They are um, have not shown any any attempt to suppress the the Bitcoin miner um, production market. Um, and I think that all of that is more difficult to explain if if you were to if you were to say China has a kind of domination strategy for Bitcoin um, because. Mm. At least I don't grasp what this strategy could be, um, or how it could be even possible for anybody. Even no matter how many how many chips they have, how many how many ASICs they have, um, to take control over Bitcoin, and because I think that power is slipping away from them too, as they would have a strong incentive to to execute their plan while they still have the majority of the ASIC share. Um, when in recent years, um, yeah. Foundries in, in Korea um, have um, also successfully taped out ASIC chips. Mm. They, I think, just politically assembling a, a miner, assembling a computer, is, is very much acceptable. Nobody asks what these things are used for. Um, all people ask you is uh, what's the percentage of, uh, of miners that you export. Uh, what's that's a important metric for businesses in China. It's like how, how, what percentage of their products are built for export. And if it's a high percentage, then um, they're largely being left alone because they generate like an inflow of um, currency. Do you have any opinion on uh, Monero's uh, strategy to eliminate ASIC mining uh, for the purposes of creating a more decentralized network? Do you have an opinion there on what Monero um, did versus what Bitcoin has done? I mean, generally, I think that's uh, that would be an important goal, not so much to eliminate ASICs, but to decentralize mining. Um, and yeah, Bitcoin is by far not uh, as decentralized in that regard. Um, the other side is that I do think it's also important to have these chips as a, as a sunk cost. Um, and in, in mining algorithms, um, like in Monero, it's still easy to repurpose the chip for uh, either another coin or even a complete different functionality. Um, and that means that if you are trying to attack that blockchain with a 51% attack, then after you're successful, you can then successfully sell your um, your miners uh, for another purpose. Uh, while in Bitcoin, like the um, like destroying Bitcoin means to destroy the value of like your entire assets. I think for for a big government that probably doesn't uh, matter as much, right? They would be more than willing to destroy that value. 
um, but it does matter for like the the game theoretical um, um, yeah concerns of how dominant actors within within a system um, are working. Are there are there a lot of uh, you know miners that that are in China and Hong Kong or, or I guess China? Um, yeah, there's still quite a few. Um, so I have to admit I haven't seen any of the Chinese miners in, in maybe two years. Um, partly that's because Hong Kong has not been an acceptable place to visit in the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, and partly also because I think I have this suspicion a lot of them just personally moved outside of China. They're, hmm. um, they're building their lives in, in, in Thailand or in Malaysia or even in Canada. Um, in Hong Kong, the miners that are, the Hong Kong miners that are still around, um, they mainly focus on like smaller aspects of it. They would either um, for example, just run these kind of data centers and then try to shift the risk of of the of owning the actual mine uh, to somebody else, um, or they would be in the process of of, of, of trading those uh, those assets. Um, so there isn't, I think, there is nobody who owns the machines, owns the data center, buys the electricity themselves. Um, and then also mines themselves. Um, this is all. This is all always a group of, of, of different individuals who specialize in different things. Um, there are some people who are exclusively electricity brokers, and other people that are exclusively holding capital um, and investing capital into these businesses. And others are are um, considering themselves purely with like running the the machines. Hmm. So are, yeah, are so you it's not so much it's not so much ver it's not so much uh, vertically integrated as it is horizontally integrated like an electricity broker might uh, be in charge of procuring electricity for different mines um, but rarely somebody really takes control of a, of a complete mine that's my impression from from talking to like the people in Hong Kong who still have their involvement in the mining in China so are you in Hong Kong to stay or are you uh, thinking of moving on to, to greener pastures uh um, I'm for now here to stay. Um, I do. Um, I'm quite concerned, of course. Um, I do believe that the situation is very volatile, and that volatility is enough to, um, yeah, to get me a bit cautious. Uh, but we're not yet at the point where it's easy to say Hong Kong is dead, and none of this will be a little place anymore anytime soon. Um, so there's really any reason to like leave right now, um, but of course it does change uh, like personal decisions of um, yeah of whether you want to get a new couch or things like this. Because like oh well, how long how long I'm going to use that couch? <laughs> if I, if I, am I going to find a new if I if I don't like my apartment if I'm looking for something bigger? I'm uh, probably not going to do that now because I'm going to have to sign like a two year lease. <laughs> and where are you from originally? You're uh, I was born in Italy. Oh, okay. I grew up mainly in like German speaking Europe. Wow. All right. Well well thanks for coming on. I you know, I learned a yeah. lot and you know it's it's very interesting to to get a perception of what you know, a re a real take on what's going on over there. And yeah, uh, thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. And you know, hopefully maybe we could talk again in the future. If I ever yeah, make it yeah. over there, we could uh, we could do a, a Monero. Yeah, yeah um, I'd love to. I'd love to. And, uh, yeah, Thanks for your that. interest in Hong Kong. Of course, of course. Is there anywhere where people can learn more about you and maybe what's the things um, that you're you can find? You can find all the links to our meetup and social media on bitcoin.org.hk. All right. All right. Thanks, Leah. I appreciate it. Cool. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.